Good afternoon and welcome. Um, let, me, let me start by getting the uh, bow tie thing out of the way. <laughs> I see a lot of fake bow ties out there. I myself am wearing a real bow tie. <laughs> and I tied this bow tie, and it's the first time in my adult life I've tied a bow tie. <laughs> Yeah, that is the good news. The bad news is it took me an hour and five minutes, and I did it after watching three YouTube videos, the last one of which was conducted by a guy with a thick French accent. But I am here in pure homage to Alan Henrikson, as are everybody wearing a clip-on, well done. A round of applause for bow ties. Well, I will have a few things to say about Alan as I introduce him uh, momentarily, but I want to begin by simply acknowledging that uh, Professor Alan Henriksen is with us today with his beautiful wife, Pam, his children, Katie and Christopher, his many, many fellow colleagues, the faculty who are the heart of the Fletcher School are here for him today, as well as the administration of the Fletcher School. And above all, I know he would say, other than his family, the most important people in this house are his students. So welcome to every one of you. I uh, have the honor of introducing Alan, and I'm going to talk about his 45-year um, voyage at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Um, and I'd invite you, particularly those of you such as myself who are old enough to remember 1971, to cast your mind back. And those of you like Professor Sulman Khan, who wasn't born in 1971, <laughs> I would invite you to cast your mind back to what Alan Henriksen taught you about American foreign policy and what the world was like in 1971. We had, a, we had arguably the worst president and the worst vice president in American history. Um, that would be Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew. Spiro Agnew, by the way, is the uh, most senior Greek American ever in the U.S. government. And as a Greek American, I disavow him completely. <laughs> in 1971, the median house price in the United States of America was $22,000. A gallon of gasoline cost 39 cents. The uh, hot movie of the year was Harvard graduate Alan Henriksen. Do you remember? It was Love Story. Love Story. Yeah, I'm sure she did. The Doors were the biggest band. And uh, James Taylor, second leading number of gold records that year. Uh, in the world, Vietnam was still on fire. Uh, India and Pakistan went to war. 71, a turbulent year a long time ago. That's the year young Professor Alan Henriksen showed up at the Fletcher School along with Pam and went to work teaching for us. And for the next 45 years, he educated generation after generation of American and international students. I tried to come up with a, a total number of students who have passed under your steady hand. Um, it's certainly hundreds, and probably somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000, I would guess, who have been touched by you in some way or another. You are a internationally renowned expert in diplomacy, particularly in the diplomatic history of the United States. Alan occupies the Lee Dirks chair, and I'm very happy that Lee Dirks is here, a former student of Alan's, uh, to support Alan, as he has not only with his generosity in creating this chair, but also as a friend of decades standing. Alan is not only an expert in diplomatic history, but he's an, a deep expert in transatlantic 
relations. We have here today uh, two of our European Union fellows, part of uh, many, many fellows, 14 in the last 20 years, who have represented that bond between the Fletcher School and the European Union. Later, we'll have a presentation by them. But Alan's expertise in transatlantic relations stands alongside his expertise in American U.S. diplomatic history. He is also, and, and I must say, uh, in 1981, when your humble dean arrived here as a student, uh, the first classroom I walked into at the Fletcher School, the first class I took was Alan Henriksen's European Diplomatic History course. Uh, and we began with the Congress of Vienna. <laughs> and until then, I only knew that Congress was something in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Uh, what I learned about Alan Henriksen from the Enlightenment, uh, from diplomatic history, from the way European history wove into global history, were lessons that I called upon 35 years later as the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. You can drop a plumb line from my 26-year-old self walking into that classroom with Alan Henriksen to my performance as the NATO commander. Those lessons were with me and remain with me today. I am but one example of hundreds, if not several thousand students who've been touched by you in your expertise on European diplomatic history. Finally, I want to point to an area of scholarship that I think Alan has developed uh, more profoundly and more sharply than any other scholar. And that is the intersection of cartography, maps, and diplomacy. He has created an entire body of scholarship which understands how our mental maps, how we think about uh, where borders are, where boundaries are, how big is the Arctic in our mind, um, so often, policymakers think and act based on a mental map that they carry with them. And I know that for a fact. I've done it myself again and again as I thought about different operations and missions. I learned that as well from Alan Henriksen in one of the four classes I took from him, uh, that one being uh, a look at the Atlantic Ocean the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap, and the way it influenced NATO's thinking during the Cold War. So I could go on for a long time about Alan's scholarship, but I will simply tell you that uh, in the course of my lifetime as a student, and I consider myself still a student, I still drop into classrooms here, as our faculty knows, Alan Henriksen is the best pure teacher I have ever been in a classroom with. <laughs> Pam has been with him for every sea mile of that voyage, as we would say. And I would uh, like, if I could, ask for her to be presented with flowers from the Fletcher School to say thank you for being an incredibly involved faculty wife here at the Fletcher School. Thank you very much, Pam. <laughs> And lastly, before I turn the floor over to Professor Henriksen to uh, give us a lecture this afternoon, I wanted to close with a short dialogue from a film that I love. And the film is A Man for All Seasons. It was written, the screenplay, by Robert Bolt, a brilliant, brilliant film. If you have not seen it or haven't seen it in a couple of decades, 
go back and watch it again. It is full of so many different brilliant thoughts on integrity and morality and courage. But it has uh, an exchange on being a teacher that has remained with me uh, throughout my life, really. And it is a conversation between Sir Thomas Moore, Saint Thomas Moore in the Catholic faith, and Richard Rich, one of the most villainous, ambitious courtiers of the rather venal court of Henry VIII. And in this conversation, Richard Rich, who at one point had been mentored by Thomas More, approaches Moore and says, what should I do with my life? He's an ambitious young man. And Moore says, why not be a teacher? And Richard Rich, who dreams of great power and great fame, says, but if I was a teacher, who would know it? And Moore says, you would know it. Your students would know it. Your family would know it. Your friends would know it. God would know it. A very good audience. Teaching is not about fame and power. It's about our students, our family, our friends, our school, and the legacy we leave in the people we have taught. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Alan Henriksen. <laughs> I suppose I'd better not be speechless. <laughs> um, but I almost feel I'd, I'd like to be. Jim, thank you. For the historical context, he contextualized me, all of us. Um, I've often said, I think even in print, Jim Stravitas is the most resourceful student I've ever had. <laughs> I mean, the average sale price of a house in 1971 the history, I've taught you that. I mean, that I expect you to know, but he remembers these things as well. <laughs> and and he, he, puts, he puts it to use, a plumb line. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of other lines that also have, have converged you know, on your career along the ways. But to be, to be just one filament in that uh, is something of which I'm very proud. So thank you. Thank you, too, for getting the bow tie thing out of the way. I had thought of saying something about it because several students gave me this tie, this Fletcher colored tie, which I've just worn for the first time. It's very crisp and bright, it has the right color. But then I decided against it. So thank you <laughs> for disposing of that. But I'm almost blinded by these, these butterflies, you know, <laughs> out there in the field. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, and believe me, I'm very glad to be here today. Uh, when I accepted Jerry's invitation and Jim's invitation to speak on this occasion, I, I said yes. Uh, but I didn't realize that uh, it could have been a real challenge. Uh, I feel uplifted uh, and really you know, sort of further recovered and healed uh, by being here with you all. Uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is deeply meaningful for me and for my whole family. Uh, my wife, Pam, and, and my son, Christopher, and, and my daughter, Katie, our daughter, Katie, and son, Christopher, uh, who've come from Santa Monica, California, uh, just to be with us today. Um, I do have a text. And uh, with your indulgence, I'd like to follow it pretty closely. But I'll try to sort of follow it, read it with, with, with a certain expression. Uh, and the, uh, when Jerry and, and Jim asked me uh, to do this, um, after I had already made, actually, the decision that this would be my last year of teaching 
at Fletcher uh, at age 75, which I can't believe, but nonetheless, it's true, <laughs> um, if I would speak during reunion. And I, of course, said yes. And then sometime later, Kate Ryan, a former student who's head of development, um, and alumni relations at Fletcher following up asked me what the title of my talk would be, and I thought about it, and the first thing that crossed my mind was something that Rule Bartlett said to me when I came to, to the Fletcher School. He said, it's a great place to teach. And it's not in my text, but I'd like to pause here and ask, besides Lee Dirks, who I know uh, was a student of Rule Bartlett's, and, and that experience meant a lot to Lee, uh, who has contributed to the Fletcher School, uh, the Lee E. Dirks Professorship in Diplomatic History. But I'd like to ask for a show of hands. I see, I see Arthur House over there. Oh, there are many others. Dorothy, so, so many. Um, I got to know uh, Rubel reasonably well. Uh, we overlapped before he moved to California. Um, and the second year, after I'd sort of gotten my footing a little bit, uh, at Fletcher, um, I invited him, asked him if he would give a lecture in my course. Um, and it happened to be World War II. I still use my notes from his lecture. <laughs> and I credit him. Uh, if there are some students from History 200, 201 here now, and there are some, uh, they'll remember. Uh, what I said about Ruhl's perspective on the diplomacy of World War II and there's a broader lesson in this. I hadn't planned to mention this either. But it happened to be the time when revisionism, new left historiography, was in vogue. At the, it wasn't just Joseph Stalin that caused the Cold War. It was the United States itself, the open door policy, atomic diplomacy, and so on. Uh, well, Rule asked, people are, are saying, posing the question, you know, who broke up the wartime alliance? And he said, there was no wartime alliance. The United States and the United Kingdom had combined boards, had a very intimate working relationship. Their relationship with Russia was very loose and involved lend-lease support. It was really only the US that had any relationship with the Republic of China, so there really was not a, a, war, a wartime alliance. So the whole premise of a lot of the Cold War, the revisionist historiography, was, was faulty, not necessarily in detail. But what he showed was the importance of perspective, of looking at things in a different way. So that's a general lesson that I have taken away from my relatively brief but, but significant encounter uh, with Rule. A great place to teach, he said. Now I assume that what Rule meant by saying that was that the Fletcher School was a great place to teach at, rather than a great place to instruct, to edify, <laughs> or to try to do so. But I shall come back to that. Well, I would like to think that I, too, have had some influence on, on the Fletcher School. But what I am now equally conscious of, as I could not have been back then, was how much I would learn myself from teaching at the Fletcher School, from my faculty colleagues, uh, from administrative staff, and most of all, as Jim Stavrida said, from my students including students who didn't happen to be in any of my classes, but who have become friends. When following the stroke I recently suffered, I was in the Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital, a beautiful new facility overlooking Boston Harbor, and my son Christopher and daughter Katie flew in from California to be with me. Christopher asked me at one point if I felt that I had any regrets in life. I said that no, I really didn't. Uh, and that I felt very grateful for the experiences and career I've had. My many years of teaching at the Fletcher School, working with and getting to know students and others from so many different nations, some of whom my wife Pam and I have had the chance to visit in their homes, has opened up the world for me. The whole experience has been deeply meaningful. If I have in my courses taught students the nuts and bolts of diplomatic history. My students have taught me so much more about places, about people, about predicaments, about philosophies, and about the manifold gift of humanity. I am very grateful. Fletcher, a great place to teach. 
to which I would now, upon reflection, add the words, and to learn. Why is the Fletcher School such a place? I can easily give three reasons which I shall briefly mention and on which I will then elaborate. First of all, for me personally, Fletcher has been, I feel, a good fit. Given who I am, what I know, the way I think, and what I have learned and still am able to learn. I am interested, as many of you know, in almost everything and in the relationships between things and also in making precise connections between them. Fletcher has allowed me the intellectual freedom to do this, to be myself. A second reason is the students coming from all over the world, diverse in background and in outlook and determined to make the world better. A third reason is the school itself, the institution. There is an idealism built into this place. It has a long-standing commitment to service, a newer interest in leadership, and now, too, a focus on entrepreneurship, including social entrepreneurship. For me, these three reasons work together in a kind of rationale for being here, for teaching here, for learning here. They provide a logic for someone such as myself as an individual faculty member for the many students I've been able, able to teach and for the institution that you and I, we all together have built and still are building. That logic has not always been clear or coherent, but neither is the world. The problems of which we are trying to address, to understand, to formulate, and to solve theoretically and in the field. The tension between theory and practice, as between ideal and reality, and even indeed between law and diplomacy, is always there. Law with its emphasis on principle and diplomacy with its emphasis on agreement can be difficult to harmonize. But this is exactly what the faculty, students, and graduates of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy have been trying to do since the school's founding in 1933. For me personally, the opportunity to teach history and to teach current issues historically at Fletcher has been invaluable. I am not narrow or segmented in my thinking or professional preparation. Neither is history, actual history itself. The subject of history does entail the careful examination of documents and the interweaving of bits of evidence. It also requires intellectual scope and imagination. History is all inclusive. It doesn't exclude any factors that might be relevant in a situation. The historian's outlook, I like to think, is akin to that of a doctor a diagnostician. Many years ago, uh, when I read Boris Pasternak's Dr. Zhivago, I noted particularly Pasternak's emphasis on the physician Yuri Zhivago's gift of diagnostic insight. I sensed that what the central character, Zhivago, and Pasternak himself was really doing was diagnosing the whole of Russian society that was undergoing a revolution. I have often told my students at Fletcher of what Henry Kissinger is said to have said. History is the only policy science. Now I come to the second and main reason for having found the Fletcher School a great place to teach and therein learn. Uh, that reason is Fletcher students and Fletcher graduates. When I joined the faculty in the fall of 1971, the United States was, as Dean Stavridis as pointed out, mired in war in Indochina. There were Vietnam War veterans who were here in those days, and some foreign service officers who had served there too. The school, the school was viewed as being generally supportive of the war. One Sunday morning, the office of Dean Ed McGullion was incinerated <coughs> by a firebomb thrown through a large glass window facing the tennis courts. It was not an easy time for any of us, whatever our thoughts. What I learned from that time was respect for the views of others, whether based on hard, real experiences 
or on deep moral convictions. I learned not to be judgmental. I have also learned to respect fearlessness and those who take decisive action. Many of our graduates, women as well as men, have intrepidly gone out into the field where they have worked with refugees and others in dire need. I marvel at the self-confidence and bravery they have demonstrated. One graduate who immediately comes to mind is Maria J. Christensen, who headed the Darfur office of the Danish Relief Council during the 2006 Danish cartoon controversy. The Janjaweed <coughs> attacked her encampment and she quickly had to arrange an evacuation. I asked her later, weren't you afraid? I'm a farm girl, she said. In recognition of this and other selfless efforts on the world's, in the world's hotspots on her part, Maria Christensen received the Ola Lippmann Memorial Award given every five years in honor of a Danish World War II resistance leader. For Maria's example, and also the stories of other Fletcher graduates, including um, diplomats and development experts who have served in difficult places, I have learned to notice and to honor personal courage. Our students have made significant contributions at the Fletcher School itself as well. One contribution that I would particularly like to mention is the founding of the Fletcher Forum of World Affairs. For years at Fletcher, there was an unresolved question as to whether the Fletcher School should have its own journal or should encourage Fletcher people, faculty and students, to publish in already established journals elsewhere. Several students, perhaps just fed up with this, ex this endless discussion, took the initiative and with a little help from the school, created the Fletcher Forum. They were Jeffrey Sheehan, who went on to become the Dean for International Affairs at the Wharton School. Um, for, uh, and another was the late Frederick Smith, who served as Principal Assistant Secretary for International Security Affairs in the US Department of Defense. He once told me he had the longest title in Washington. <laughs> and Shashi Tarur, a distinguished novelist and currently a parliamentarian in India who became the Under Secretary General for Communications and Public Information of the United Nations. Those three and many other students in their own ways have taught me the value of fresh eyes and impatience, as well as of energy and initiative and also ambition. Fletcher students are very diverse. They are also famously collaborative, maintaining from year to year the living tradition of Fletcher community. From a teacher's perspective, the diversity of our student body is a pedagogical challenge. This is partly because our students come from so many different backgrounds and have such different expectations and objectives. I marvel at the linguistic attainment of so many of our students some of whom speak not only two or three, but even four or five languages. Others, to be sure, struggle. I shall, ne <laughs> I shall never forget something that General Jack Galvin, as our dean, said in speaking to a group of new foreign students at Fletcher. He said that Americans tend to think of those who speak a lot of languages as having a knack for it. It takes work, he emphasized. And he gave full marks to those students from elsewhere, non-native English speakers, who had made the effort necessary to learn English at the level required to be admitted to the Fletcher School. Congratulations to them. You inspire me. This brings me to my third and final reason why Fletcher is a great place at which to teach and at which to learn, the school itself. To me, as my faculty colleagues have heard me say more than once, the Fletcher School is an institution of the higher learning. It is a place of and for scholarship, researched, crafted, serious, original, 
may be novel and potentially significant academic work. Thus, I naturally am a defender of the traditional thesis. All of the capstones I have just read and evaluated were traditional theses, and they were excellent. I'm looking, I'm looking at Dina Mirren. <laughs> Doing their authors proud. From these students' work and from all the other research papers I have read over the years, I have learned more than I otherwise ever would have known about the subjects they addressed. I was delighted to see the message that our Fletcher librarian, Cynthia Rubino, has just sent to our students that the Ginn Library is facilitating the submission of Fletcher capstones for inclusion in the Fletcher Digital Library. This service is intended, Cindy wrote, to capture the significant intellectual capital represented in your capstone and to make it available to your friends and family and also potential employers. Her use of the term intellectual capital particularly caught my eye. Intellectual capital is a term that I myself often have used in talking with students about the value of historical knowledge. As I have emphasized most recently in History 201 early this spring term, the facts of history are real. Events actually happened. The record of them is solid and permanent. They are worth remembering. Knowledge of history is like money in the bank. It can be drawn upon and it can be augmented by further study, of course, and also uh, through experience. Henry Kissinger, when he went on to Washington, said that while serving in government, he was going to have to live off intellectual capital. He had a lot of it, and he thrived. I hope that the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy will never lose its interest in the teaching of history. History is the central intelligence of statecraft. Diplomatic history, which has been my principal subject, is also about diplomacy itself. When I came to Fletcher in 1971, a prevailing assumption was that the whole school understood what diplomacy is and, in fact, spoke it. There never actually had been a course at Fletcher, to the best of my knowledge, on diplomacy as such. Today, it does have such a course, uh, Diplomacy 200, Diplomacy, History, Theory, and Practice, as well as now a formal certificate in diplomatic studies. There had then been a course taught by Dean Gullion himself, along with General Indar Jit Rikki on United Nations peacekeeping, but that's different. In truth, most of, the, most of the emphasis of the Fletcher School's curriculum during the Cold War and Vietnam War period was on conflict. Um, the theme was then the rule of law and the role of force, which is something that Dean Gullion uh, quite often used to say. That focus was understandable. The strategic rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union was everyone's paramount concern. It was existential. And at times, as during the Cuban Missile Crisis, it was frightening. The world that we studied and taught about then was bipolar, deeply split between East and West and relatedly between North and South. I soon began to realize that the American multilateral tradition, the Wilsonian tradition, which I had studied as a purely historical subject, was being lost. I therefore began to read and to learn, as I could only have done at the Fletcher School from the work and wisdom of Fletcher colleagues, including Leo Gross, Bob Marr, and Field Haviland, something about international organization. I am very grateful to the Fletcher School for that legacy and that resource. With the approach of the Fletcher School's 50th anniversary in 1983-84, when Ted Elliott was our dean, I saw that there was an opportunity to do something. During that academic year, I organized and led the Negotiating World Order Project, a series of lectures by and informed discussions with some of the world's leading diplomats, economists, lawyers, and others 
who had been engaged in negotiating solutions to major international problems. A result of our Fletcher project was the book Negotiating World Order, The Artisanship and Architecture of Global Diplomacy. In commenting on it, Senate Foreign Relations Committee Chairman J. William Fulbright wrote, as is on the back of the dust cover, Negotiating world order is a timely reminder that only negotiation and conciliation among nations can save the world from disaster. Survival of a decent life requires cooperation and diplomacy, not more nuclear weapons. The Fletcher School's curriculum has undergone a vast expansion in recent years, with courses on many more subjects. Many of these are quite specialized even technical in nature. And many of them are skills oriented. Perhaps the biggest curriculum change has been the addition of the Master of International Business degree. I recall with some amusement after the MIB degree was decided upon participating in a meeting with a group of Fletcher alumni. Perhaps some of you were there. The meeting was chaired by Dean Stephen Bosworth a man of powerful intellect and diplomatic skill who had shepherded that curricular innovation through. I was the only faculty member present. One of the recent graduates asked me, rather mischievously, I thought, what my own view was of the new business degree. I thought. <laughs> In response, I said that as a historian, whose subject is time, I knew the probability of, and therefore was open to, change. <laughs> yes, Dean Bosworth commented dryly, after it happens. <laughs> I should have seen that coming. Uh, we all had a good laugh, fortunately. I would like to think that as a teacher of diplomatic history at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, I have had foresight as well as hindsight. I know that my students are looking at the future. I hope that such intellectual capital as I have been able to give them on the basis of my knowledge and understanding of the ideas and events of the past will serve them well. And that this will be an intellectual reservoir for which they can draw in their professional work and their professional lives. The Fletcher School has been, for me, a great place to teach and to learn. Thank you for learning along with me. And thank you most, most sincerely for listening to me this afternoon. What a marvelous, fascinating, historically accurate, <laughs> moving and inspirational talk, Alan. It was gorgeous. Um, we have one other presentation which I think uh, really speaks to the transatlantic part of Alan's legacy at the Fletcher School. Uh, as I mentioned, he has been iconic in ensuring that those linkages across the Atlantic remain strong. He's shepherded a generation of European Union fellows. We have uh, two of the fellows, the current year fellow, Julia Stewart David, as well as last year's fellow, Akum Ludwig, who are both here today, and uh, they would like to step up and present you with uh, some gifts from Europe that uh, sort of make the point of the transatlanticness. <laughs> And I would also like to announce that uh, the Fletcher School has 
under Allen's leadership, has come into an agreement to create a joint degree with the College of Europe, which is the Graduate School of Diplomacy in Europe. This degree, a joint degree, will be called a Master of Arts in Transatlantic Diplomacy. And I would like to call it the Alan Henriksen degree. <laughs> so I'll ask these two to give, a, <clears throat> give their gifts. Oh. Oh, I'm, I'm touched by this. Thank you. Yeah. Akim and I taught a course together. And Julia's field is different. She's a specialist on uh, narrowly humanitarian evaluation, but the whole humanitarian spectrum generally. And Fletcher, with its em emphasis on human security, human rights, is, is a natural place for Julia to be. She has participated in I don't know how many courses, including my course on diplomacy. She's given talks here and elsewhere, as, as also Akim did uh, when he was here as a European. We're, we're, I'm proud to have you be my friends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. What a wonderful way to start a spectacular alumni weekend. I hope many of you will join us for the clam bake later on this evening. We have Ariana Huffington coming tomorrow to speak. We have panels too exotic and interesting to name on Saturday, culminating in a graduation for 250 of Fletcher's finest students, so many of them having passed under Alan Henriksen's loving gaze. Please join us in a reception outside to celebrate 45 years of Alan Henriksen's gift to the Fletcher School.